I've been talking about gifts that we can bring to Jesus. These aren't one-time gifts, but these are lifelong commitments that we make to bring to him. Again, I remind you, he needs nothing, but he does delight in our giving. We saw in Romans chapter 6 that we are called upon to give ourselves and our members as instruments of righteousness. I hope and pray that you are thinking about that and doing that every day of your life, saying, God, here I am, every part of me, to serve you, to be an instrument of righteousness. Last week we saw in 1 Peter 2 that we have the, the privilege of offering the gift of worship, and especially corporate worship, where we are made alive in Christ and made part of this living house with other living stones where we offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That is something we do continually and I pray that you are offering up even at this moment a spiritual sacrifice to God, worshiping Him. Tonight I want to talk about giving Him your praise and specifically by praise as our writer defines it confessing the name of Jesus Christ. Read with me, follow along please, as I read out of Hebrews chapter 13, beginning in verse 10. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge His name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. We are to offer up sacrifices of praise to God, that is, specifically, the fruit of lips that acknowledge or confess his name. The Greek word there is the word that is used in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin. It's actually a combination of two Greek words, which simply means to say the same thing, or to agree, or to affirm. When you confess your sin, you agree with God. You say the same thing about your sin that God says, that it's ugly, it's dirty, it's offensive. It can only be cleansed by the blood of Christ. That's what confession is. It's not just, I'm sorry. It's saying, I agree with God what he, with what he says about my sin. So when he uses that word here, acknowledge his name, when we confess the name of Jesus, then we are affirming, we are agreeing with what God says about that name. We say the same thing that God says. And what does he say? Well, we know at least this from the New Testament. We know the angel said to Joseph, you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So when we confess, the name of Jesus, we are confessing that Jesus is God's only appointed Savior from sin. There is no other salvation. As Paul put it, neither is there salvation in any other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Not only is Jesus God's appointed Savior, but Jesus is the one and only Savior for all people, in all places, for all time. That is, there is no one under the sun coming to the living God by any other name 
than Jesus Christ. So when you confess the name of Jesus, you're not only confessing that he's God's appointed savior for sin, that he is the one and only savior for all people in all places at all time, but you're also confessing that he is the Lord to whom everyone one day will eventually bow. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So we're not just talking about saying the name Jesus. We're talking about affirming and agreeing with what God says about that name, that Jesus is God's appointed Savior for all men in all places at all times, and it is the name by which everyone, to which everyone is to bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And John makes it clear that if you deny the Son, you don't have the Father. You cannot have the, the true, the one and only true God without Jesus Christ. It disturbs me a little bit sometimes when I hear Christians give testimonies of God's work in their life, but they never get to Jesus. It reminds me of the time I was invited to uh, speak at a high school graduation. And before I brought the message that evening, I listened to a number of testimonies by uh, graduating seniors. They were Christian testimonies and they all talked about, you know, what God had done in their life and, you know, how much they loved God and, you know, how they were going to serve God when they graduated. And, you know, on one hand, I understand in context what's going on there, at least I hope I understand what's going on there. But on the other, stand, other hand, I was deeply aware of the absence of the name of Jesus Christ. That it's much easier to talk about God than it is about Jesus. Because most people believe in God and most people are not offended by you talking about God or even about church. But there's something about the name of Jesus, especially when you are affirming that name as the name of the one who is appointed as the savior of men for all people in all places at all time and the one to whom everyone must bow and confess that he is Lord. There's something about that name that becomes unwanted in the world that we are living in. And yet that is the name that we are to confess. This, this is the offering that we bring to God, the fruit of our lips that we confess his name. And so tonight I wanna talk for maybe a few minutes about why confess the name of Jesus. I've talked about what it is, what it means to confess the name of Jesus, but looking at our text, which you may have thought as I was reading it, what is this talking about? What is this, who are those who serve at the tent who, you know, can't eat of the altar that we eat of? And what is this, you know, the going outside the camp and carcasses being burnt outside the camp? So let me put it in the context of our call to confess the name of Jesus, because all of this is saying something about who Jesus is. So why confess the name of Jesus? First of all, because confessing the name of Jesus brings us to the only altar that actually redeems us and doesn't just redeem us, it satisfies us. We eat of this altar and of this sacrifice. When he talks about those who serve the tent, he's putting us in an Old Covenant, Old Testament, uh, Jewish context. He's reminding us of the priest who served the tent, the original tabernacle, and ultimately in the temple that replaced uh, the, the tabernacle. And their duty was to 
bring sacrifices to God. And they brought many of the sacrifices that people brought. They offered them in behalf of the people. And I know in your yearly Bible reading, because I'm sure that all of you try to read the Bible through every year, uh, when you get to the book of Leviticus, you probably skim or you skip because you start reading about all of these offerings that Israelites brought to God and the detail of those offerings and the instructions of the offerings. You had burnt offerings and peace offerings and fellowship offerings and guilt offerings and sin offerings. But if you read them carefully, you would find out that most of the offerings, the priests were able to eat a portion of it. This was how the priests and their families were sustained because when the land was allotted to the tribes of Israel, the Levites did not get land. They were to be sustained by the rest of the nation. And so they often ate of those sacrifices. But there was one sacrifice they did not eat of. When the sin offering was made, whether it was a sin offering for an individual or at times a sin offering for the nation itself, the priests would draw the blood from that animal first and sprinkle it throughout the holy place or on the day of atonement they would take the blood of one of the goats and actually go into the holy of holy place and sprinkle the blood they would take the fat portions of the the animal those good portions and they're specified which fat portions are to be taken and they would burn them on the altar and then they would take the carcass that was left over and they would take it outside the city to a place where the carcass would be burnt. The priest did not eat of that sin offering. They did not fellowship in that way in that sin offering. But we do. Jesus, as we know, is the is the antitype, the fulfillment of all of those sacrifices, whether it's the peace or the guilt or the fellowship uh, offering or the grain offering. He is the antitype, the fulfillment of all of those. He is the both the sin offering, as we'll see, that is placed on the altar and offered up to God, but he is also, almost ironically, he is also the carcass that is rejected and disposed and burnt outside uh, the, 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 the camp. But, but the writer is saying, we eat of this offering. That this is what sustains us. Jesus, who is both altar and sacrifice and rejected carcass, he is the one on whom we feed. Matter of fact, if you listen to Jesus' words, they, at face value, on surface, seem very disturbing. Jesus said one day, he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to this? But Jesus, knowing in himself that, it, that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? 
If you take offense, you can't quite capture and understand what I'm saying when I'm saying eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, then how much more confused will you be when you see me leave this earth? Because how would you even do it then? And then he says, it's the spirit who gives life. It's not literal flesh and blood. It's the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Now I know there are some among Christianity who believe that by some magic, this, this can actually become the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus. And that it's your eating of this on a regular basis that sustains your relationship with God, that you are actually intaking Jesus Christ. Now I think there's a couple of problems with that. Not just the exegetical problems, the scriptural problems, but one of the problems with that is if that's the case, then it's under the control of an institution. That the distribution of the life that God offers you is actually under the control of an institution and particular people who have the power to say words that transform it and to distribute it. And that just, if you read the New Testament, that's not Christianity. I mean, you have this intimate, personal, real relationship with Christ that, 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 that is being nourished not just when someone distributes this to you, but can be nourished when you're lying in your bed, when you're walking by the way, when you're at work, that you have this, this life-giving relationship, union with Christ that sustains you all the time. So the notion that an institution or men have the power to control and distribute this is so contrary to the Bible. But the idea that in order to sustain that life, to feed on Jesus, is limited to certain times. That you have to go to a certain place, you have to go to a, through a certain ritual, and that if you will really feed on Jesus and eat his blood, uh, drink his blood and eat his flesh, uh, it's limited to certain times. I believe if you read John 6 carefully that Jesus makes it clear that eating and drinking are simply coming to him and believing on him. The beginning of the chapter, the middle of the chapter, Jesus said this, he said, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me will never hunger. So coming is eating because you're not hungry. And he that believes in me will never thirst. So believing is drinking. And both of those verbs are constant verbs. Whoever keeps coming, whoever keeps believing. How do we live off of Jesus Christ? How are we nourished? How do we eat of this sacrifice? Is it simply in an act of, of, of lit liturgy, of communion? Or is it by living day by day by faith in the words of God. And as I come to him and believe on him, wherever I am, with whatever is going on in my life, I can be nourished, I, my soul can be satisfied in Jesus Christ. This is as distinct a unique altar that we eat on, that we eat of this sacrifice. But not only do we confess this name because it is the only altar which offers you redemption and satisfaction? We confess his name because confessing the name of Jesus identifies us with the one who though despised by the world is accepted by God. Hebrews theme here is similar to the theme of 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 through 8 that we looked at last week. 
The stone which the builders rejected, the same is made the head of the corner. This, the builders of this world's kingdom said, we don't want Jesus, we don't like his exclusive claims, we don't like that, that he claims to be God and the only Savior, we don't want him, we'll cast him aside. And God took that rejected stone and made him the cornerstone of his eternal kingdom. Well, here he's saying that this, this Jesus is like the carcass of that sin offering that was cast aside, that was seen as something that was vile, that, that defiled the sanctuary, it was cast aside and taken outside the city, and there it was burnt. It would be a very unusual thing during the time of sacrifice in Israel to have found a Jew out at that dump that had the smell of burning flesh. Worshiping God and believing that this carcass being burnt is what is pleasing to God. It is the means by which I am coming to God. That would have never happened. The Jews believed that that carcass was rejected. And it's sort of ironic that the writer of Hebrews, though he does throughout Hebrews, identify Jesus with the sacrifice on the altar and says that he is the antitype, the fulfillment of that. What is ironic in this text is that he identifies Jesus more with the carcass that is rejected. That Jesus, instead of being killed in the temple, is killed outside the city. I would think that an ideal anti-type to fully uh, fulfill what was anticipated in Old Testament sacrifice, it would have been good for Jesus to have died in that temple, in the center of Jewish worship, where all of those other sacrifices had been offered for, for uh, about 1,400 years. But no, he's sacrificed outside the city. He's killed where the carcasses of animals would have been burnt. He is one that is despised and rejected of men. And then the writer of Hebrews says this. He says, therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach that he endured. Now, that's contrary to what most of us desire, because we desire a place of safety, we desire a place of security and a place of comfort. That would have been the temple. But God says, no, you go outside the camp. You identify with this Jesus who is despised and rejected. He's like the carcasses that were burnt. I'm not a great church historian, but I've read enough of church history and understand enough about church history that as I think of it, I think it's a rare time, perhaps a non-existent time, when the church, in its faithfulness to confessing the name of Jesus, was ever at the center of society. That when you confess the name of Jesus, you're normally marginalized. And by confessing the name of Jesus, I remind you what that means, that this is God's appointed Savior for all men, for all, in all places, at all times, that he is Lord, that everyone must bow to him that where Christianity finds its place in the center square, when it finds its place in acceptability, when we have arrived where the religious world and the popular world and the civil leaders are acclaiming or accepting Christianity, it is most often, if not always, because the name of Jesus and all that that stands for has been minimized. 
beginning with Constantine. Perhaps the worst thing that happens to Christianity is when it becomes accepted. And for some reason, we, we work hard at finding that acceptance. And it's not always conscious, but in order to do that, ultimately you have to mark, you have to diminish the significance of the claims of Jesus Christ. And so we want a Christianity that's nice, and you ought to be nice, by the way. We want a Christianity that, you know, does good things, acceptable things in the world, and you ought to want to do good things and acceptable things in this world. But often, we are not proclaiming, or as our text says, confessing the name of Jesus. We're fitting in, but we're fitting in at the expense of the name of Jesus Christ. Because to confess that name means we go outside the camp. We're not in the temple area, we are in the area of rejection. I have found that I am welcome in ecumenical settings as long as I diminish the claims that belong to the name of Jesus Christ. I can stand alongside Muslims and feed the homeless or distribute clothing to the poor. I can do all sorts of good things in society as a Christian and be loved and accepted until I confess the name of Jesus. And by that I don't simply mean saying I'm a Christian. By that I mean you are affirming and agreeing that these exclusive claims of Christ are true. I mean, try it at a family gathering. Try it when you're, you know, out to eat with your friends. You know, talk about church and talk about music and talk about doing good and talk about morals. And, you know, you might have some uh, feisty discussions on some of those things, but you know, you, nobody really cares that you go to church every Sunday, that you're a good person, that you're nice, that you care for needy people, that you're merciful. They like that. But bring in the name of Jesus. Ask them, do you confess Jesus as God's only Savior and Lord? And you will find that you are pushed out to where he is. That's the name of Jesus. But we confess it because in identifying with that rejected stone, we become part of a building that lasts forever. A corn, we become part of his eternal kingdom. So we confess that name, even though it's a name that's despised and rejected of men. Thirdly, we confess that name because confessing the name of Jesus fixes my hope on his future. When I'm confessing the name of Jesus, I'm reminding myself, as Dawn and I and my brother and his wife used to sing in a quartet, believe it or not, you don't want to hear it, but, uh, but one of the songs we sang was, This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blow. This world's not my home. The writer of Hebrews says, in identifying with Jesus and confessing his name, we understand that here, we have no continuing city. We long for it, we all do, we long for home. We long for that place of safety, that place of security, that place of comfort, that place of rest, but we have no continuing city here. You know the history of Israel. 
Everything centers around the fate of the city of Jerusalem. For thousands of years, to the present and into the future, unfortunately, wars have been fought, blood has been shed, and will continue to be shed because there's something significant about having that city here. But Paul says, if you're in Christ, those who confess the name of Jesus, here we have no continuing city. This is not our place of final rest, of security, of comfort. Our citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who one day will change our vile body, that it may be transformed like unto his glorious body, and will be with him. We're waiting, we're looking for that city that John saw, that new Jerusalem coming down with heaven, from heaven, filled with the glory of God. We confess the name of Jesus because we believe that our future is tied to him. It's not tied to this world. To a Jew, Jerusalem is where I must belong, and Jerusalem is what I must have. To a believer, Jesus is where I belong, and Jesus is what I must have, and my future is tied to his future. My hope is in his future that he offers us. And then fourthly, we confess the name of Jesus, because confessing the name of Jesus is what I call the best of all that is good, and the proper motivation for all the good that we can do. He's confessing is the best of all that is good and the proper motivation for all that is good. Look with me in verses 15 and 16 and I want you to think about their relationship to each other. Through him, that is through Jesus, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. This is the best thing that you can constantly do, is confess the name of Jesus. But then he says, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Now I talked about being nice and about being good and being merciful and I don't want to diminish that, but I do want to put it in its proper place. That verse 16 is grounded in verse 15. If you have verse 16 without verse 15, then you don't have anything different than what lots of religious people have. They do good. They share what they have. Christians aren't the only generous people on earth. But these are coupled together, but not equally coupled, because the one is the consequence of the other. Confessing the name of Christ, believing this, that he is God's appointed savior, that he is the only savior for all men in all places at all time, that he is the Lord of all and that he is the one through whom I have come to know the living and true God in a very personal way. Believing that transforms, it changes me. Confessing that name makes me someone who does good who wants to share with others that are in need, who wants to be sure that the offense of confessing the name of Jesus is not my life, because the offense of the gospel is sharp enough. It divides. And so we do good. We share. God is pleased with this, because it removes, it makes us Easy to listen to, easier to listen to. It doesn't take away the sharpness of the gospel. I think one of the great problems we have in 
Christianity today is we want to live in verse 16 but not in verse 15 and you can live in verse 15, 16 all your life you can do good and share and people will like you and know that you're good and they will go on their way to hell because there's nothing about your doing good or sharing that proclaims the name of Jesus. And so we confess his name. Doing good doesn't replace it. Doing good is the fruit of it. And it makes possible the conversations that we want to have about the name of Jesus Christ. One of the best gifts you can give to anyone is to say something good about them to something else. I remember reading the story of a missionary in India who was in a particular village where they did not say thank you when someone did something for them. He was an eye doctor and as he worked in his clinic and he provided eye care for people, when they left, instead of saying thank you, they would say, I will tell your name. That's how they said thank you. God saying, I want you to tell the name of my son, Jesus Christ. There's no name like that name. That is the name that brings salvation. One of the older hymns we used to sing went something like this. The name of Jesus is so sweet. I love its music to repeat. It makes my joys full and complete. The precious name of Jesus. I love the name of him whose heart knows all my griefs and bears a part, who bids all anxious fears depart. I love the name of Jesus. No word of man can ever tell how sweet the name I love so well. Oh, let its praise ever swell. Oh, praise the name of Jesus. And then the chorus says, Jesus, oh, how sweet the name. Jesus, every day the same. Jesus, let all saints proclaim its worthy praise forever. And the good news for some of you tonight is if you have never confessed that name, the name that God appointed to be the one who saves for all men in all places at all times, that name who is the Lord of all, that name by which you come to relationship with God. The good news is, the Bible says this, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you cry out, understanding who Jesus is, God save me through Jesus Christ. In an instant, you'll be made alive, forgiven, made a child of God by the name of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, help us to grow in not being ashamed of the name of Jesus, of not being ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the only saving name, it is the only saving message. Jesus is the only person who can save. Help us to grow in not being ashamed of that name. I pray for Jesus' glory, for your glory, and for the good, the eternal good of those who are lost. I pray that you would give us grace to grow in not being ashamed of that name. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.